I'll call the meeting of the select board of January 22nd, 28 to order at 6.30 p.m. Um, at this time, Mr. Wald and Ms. Brewer are not here. Mr. Wald will not be joining us this evening and Ms. Brewer will be along shortly. Um, so uh, we'll start with our opening remarks, which I have none. Um, and if anyone else does, they certainly can follow them announcements and agenda review. So we'll start with agenda review. Um, we'll start with the public comment tonight. Generally have people uh, speak for about three minutes or so. Are there folks here for public comment? Yes. All right, so we have a couple of people for comment. comment. We'll get to that in just a moment. Is there anything needing to be added or amended in the agenda that anyone noticed? <clears throat> Our member, member reports. So. Okay. All right. So, first up is public comment. Who would like to go first? Okay. Thank you. So, Ms. Bills, if you would please just re identify yourself at the beginning and tell us what you need to tell us. Sure enough. Barb Bills, Director of Amherst Leisure Services. And thank you for um, having me tonight. I wanted to speak to you a little bit about Winterfest. 2018 we've had some big changes this year um, I don't know how hopefully you've seen some of the advertising and press releases articles and so forth mm -hmm. in the uh, in the Gazette and in the bulletin uh, so we've expanded this year to a full eight days of activities which has uh, really taken us up to a different level uh, it's, a, it's an exciting time because we're doing a lot of collaboration with local businesses and nonprofits as well as university to put together a really strong program. We have over 45 different events at at least 20 different venues, so it's a, it's a pretty amazing feat for our wonderful volunteer committee who has helped spearhead this expansion. Um, <clears throat> I'll just say, so we're starting on February 3rd with our kickoff. Our real, we'll have other events that day as well, but in the evening, um, in collaboration with the Amherst BID, uh, we'll have what's called the, Am uh, the, the Luminaria on the Amherst Common. And it'll be 2,000 luminarias that will be lit, as well as some other things. We're hoping to have uh, some ice sculptures. <coughs> Possibly snow sculptures as well, so it's it's going to be it's going to be a great event. So um, that'll be our our sort of showcase event for that first day, and uh, in between there, as I said before, there's hockey games, there's skating, there are food demonstrations, you name it, all over town. Um, and I have to thank all of the different, like I said before, the different businesses and and uh, nonprofits who have really stepped up to the plate. And uh, you know, just said, "Hey, this is a great idea. Let's let's do something special." For a lot of them, they just decided their own event, what they were going to do. Some of them, of course, were already on the calendar, like you'll see the UMass events and so forth. But um, it's just great. And then the finale event will be at Cherry Hill on the 10th, very similar to what we've had in the past with the um, you know our signature uh, activities like the cardboard classic, the chili cook-off, where we have four or five different restaurants which will vie for that coveted uh, best chili award. The best in snow uh, dog show, uh, Greenfield Savings Bank will be the judges and are sponsoring that event. And I also just want to take, you know, give a shout out to all our sponsors who are making all these events possible. So it should be a great day. Come out and enjoy all of the activities throughout the week and uh, hopefully that day as well on the 10th. So uh, if you have any questions. I do not, but do either. I was just curious because of one other thing that's on our agenda later, just briefly, but uh, what's the event at, uh, on the opening day at Simple Gift Farm? Simple Gift Farms, yeah, they are having, and I have, this is really great. Uh, this kind of gives you an idea of the breadth and depth of the activities. This is four pages, wow. and I can uh, go ahead and pass these around. But that p particular event um, is is a group it's a sing uh, it's i'm not really familiar with the group but they'll be they'll, and they'll, they can explain it later but they're having basically a performance there at their place and i understand they've asked for one day wine and malt license for that event it's a stomp box trio at simple gift farm oh. <laughs> so, so that's an independent event it's that's an independent that event. we're sort of co co-advertising it's not something that's uh yeah that, that lcc is sponsoring correct well 
I, I just wanted to say how, um, you know, in reading some of the publicity and about this, learning about the week-long Winterfest that I was um, just impressed with how ambitious it was. And it's your first year as LSSC director. And I was like, you really want to do a whole week of Winterfest? <laughs> I mean, you've done Winterfest before, but I was like, wow. But I think it's a really neat thing because you're doing it in many venues and you're pulling from the whole community. And that part of February is kind of a long, cold, dark part of the year. And so it gives us ways to come together as a community in that long, dark part. So I, I thought um, it's, it looked really neat and I, I wish you well as you kind of weave it all together. I appreciate that, but uh, it really is the, uh, the combined efforts of the volunteers on that committee that help, you know, our, our community has really stepped forward to bring all this together. And, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a fabulous week, so exciting. Thank you. Great. And I'll leave these on the back table unless you want them now. No, we'll, okay. If you give them to our clerk, he'll, sure. he'll make sure we all get, if they're, right, for, just, uh, if they're have, for us. I have extras, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. And I'll go to, excuse me. You can always go to um, our Facebook page, which is uh, Winterfest Amherst, or go to lssc.org, and you can uh, download or, or upload whatever you want to do. But all the events, the calendar is listed there in a, in a calendar uh, software called Timely. Thanks. So are there um, admission charges to any events? Some of the events do have admissions, and if you click on the different events that day, it gives you more information about which are, are free, which there are many free events. Uh, for instance, we have an early release day on the 7th, February 7th, so we'll be doing some free events for sure on those dates uh, for the kids at Crocker Farm, although the entire community is, is welcome to come to that. Um, uh, children are invited to that. And certainly the events at the library, hikes, and so forth, all those are free. But the admissions are listed if there are admissions on the, uh, the event calendar. Great. Great. Okay. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, again, for, I guess for uh, people who watch our meetings on Amherst Media again, the website has a wealth of information. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Thank you. So if you want to step forward, please, and just identify yourself with the microphone and Certainly. tell us why you're here. Hi, my name is David Clooney. I'm a Precinct 3 town meeting member, and I'm also a member of the fire department. Um, so I'm here briefly to discuss uh, my concerns with the town manager's uh, proposed budget for FY19 in particular uh, with respect to uh, the staffing recommendations for the department. <coughs> Although I was pleased to see it was the top item on uh, the town manager's uh, list of things to restore, uh, I just really can't express to you guys the level of concern that I have and that is shared by the members of the fire department um, throughout. Uh, given that we've spent money as a community on a study uh, which is the, at least the third such study since 1981 <coughs> about our staffing levels and our minimum staffing has stayed the same for the last 25 years. Um, but we haven't committed any money to do anything about the problem yet. Um, I am guardedly optimistic. I did look at the, the projections for new growth and I understand that uh, as the town manager said last week that often you don't move beyond 600,000 and, and you're guardedly optimistic this year for, to move to 830 and that sounds good. Obviously all of us are going to be looking to see what kind of money the governor releases uh, in terms of local aid and um, I'm certainly inspired by the town manager's guarded optimism there as well. Um, but I just cannot stress enough uh, how, how concerned I am. Uh, just as an example, I mean I think a lot of people look at the way the community is structured and and Travis the uh, consultant from the um, from the Carlson group addressed this that the university isn't actually the cause of a lot of our calls and a week ago Thursday I think it was the 11th I happened to be on duty and uh, it was just a, a Thursday morning there were no students in town and um, there were a bunch of ambulances out on ambulance calls which is normal and I responded back with my partner in A1 to a car fire that was impinging on a structure. And behind us, my captain pulled in in an engine alone. Uh, and he had just cleared from another call where he 
uh, had responded because they thought they were going to require three on that particular ambulance call. And it was just luck that they didn't. And if they hadn't, then I would have been responding back with my partner to Central Station to pick up an engine to then respond to a car fire that was impinging on a structure. In this particular case, the structure had uh, stone siding or a cement block, so it was good. But over the last 25 years, we continue to address this, and there just hasn't been anything done. And so I just really would urge you, I understand that there are a lot of budgetary constraints, and I understand uh, that there are a lot of challenges that go beyond the fire department, and I appreciate all the work that all of you have done on that. Um, but we're operating at a dangerous level here. And the consultant didn't say that, and that's understandable. He's a consultant, and he's a diplomatic person, and the fire chief isn't going to use that term either. He's the fire chief. He's here to protect the community. But all of us are concerned about the community, and the way that we're operating now just isn't safe. Um, in 1996, we did 3,600 calls or so. This year, we did 6,900. I'm very confident that we'll break 7,000 this coming year. And we, you, you just cannot address that emergency traffic without people. So I really appreciate all the work you guys have done. And if you have any questions for myself or anyone else, um, also I know when the consultant initially presented, the fire chief and the town manager and the consultant all talked about having a committee to look uh, more deeply at the, at the report. And I'm certainly supportive of that effort. And at that time, um, it was recommended that the union have a representative on that committee, but that hasn't happened yet. So hopefully we could have a representative in the future from the union. I think it would be helpful for the community that the people who are actually out there doing these calls be represented when you look at that committee report. So please, if you have a chance, I understand there's a lot going on. Um, take another look at that report, take another look at the Reorganization Study Committee report, and um, I wish you the best of luck with local aid and with Governor Baker's stuff. So, thank you. Thank you, So, guys. just to frame this, we don't generally, often during public comment, we just sort of take the comment, we don't respond to that, so it's not that we didn't hear you or didn't want to hear oh, you. Oh, I understand. Public <laughs> comment is three minutes for a reason. <laughs> and. Uh, but we do, we do appreciate hearing from you, and, and uh, we do take it under advisement, and so we will. Yeah, I mean, I've been talking about this for 17 years, so uh, if we don't get it solved tonight, I'll understand. But we need to work on it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else for public comment tonight? Not on an agenda item, because we have a couple of folks I know are here for agenda items, but all right. I think that's it for public comment, so we'll move on, and we'll go into our... Uh, Action and discussion items. First one up is our fiscal year 19 uh, water sewer rates. And we discussed these a little bit last time we met. Um, and so I think, uh, is Mr. Mooring going to present a little bit for us? Yes. So if Mr. Mooring would like to join us here, I, you're on, as it were. Uh, we're talking specifically about the, we're going to start with the, uh, the water and sewer rates, which we took a look at last week, I guess, and we'll potentially take action on this week. Okay, good evening. Good evening. So what you, what's been proposed for the water and sewer rates is that water rates shall go to, let me do my cheat sheet. <coughs> water rates shall go to 380, um, and sewer rates will go to 390, which is a 4% change. Um, the, main reason the sewer rates are going up is we do have some expenses that we foresee in the future and we just want to keep a slow increase so we can build a little reserve in our capital fund for some changes. Uh, one of the immediate upcoming projects we have is to replace the gravity belt thickener. This is what is used to take the liquid sludge and to thicken it up a little bit so we're not just shipping 100% liquid sludge to a, a treatment facility to be processed. Um, this is a, device which is a, around a million dollars so um, that's our first project we'll be working on and then we have a couple other things after that but the goal is is to slowly build up the reserves with this increase and keep the reserves high for the sewer with, for projects we have coming okay so I have a quick question so you've been doing some sewer extension work over the last several years some out on Harkness Road I believe some in the Amherst Woods area out on Wildflower and that can you kind of Tell us where we're at. And really what I'm thinking about more is just, I know there was 
the phase one of that proved to be a little more difficult than originally anticipated, so that extended the timeline of the project and it may have extended the price a little bit. Did that factor into this choice for uh, the, the change to the rate or has that already been incorporated in previous adjustments to our rate? That was already incorporated in previous adjustments. Okay. So where the project is though, Harkness Road's done, the, all of Amherst Woods is done with the exception of installing a pump station. <laughs> we bid the pump station out last month and we'll be purchasing it and installing it. Hopefully everything will be installed before the end of the summer. The new sewer lines we have to let wait a year before we let people connect to. That's our process. So the sewer pump station will be finished and everything will be all set for that section of Amherst Woods for the end of the construction season. We do have work which will start in Station Road and we'll do some Station Road work. The only thing we have <coughs> left to do after Station Road is to do the uh, Iduna, Cortland uh, area, those neighborhoods, and we're kind of met, playing around with uh, how we want to do that section. That's all low pressure sewer, so it's not a big pipe, it's a small pipe, um, but that's where we are with the whole project. And as I said before, that was covered in the increases in the rates before. Other questions? Yes. Yes, um, a couple of weeks ago, maybe maybe more than a month ago now, um, we had a presentation about some possible future water supply projects. And I see that right now you're not asking for an, um, a change of rate for the water, but I'm wondering, does that mean when we get to those projects we will not have built up our reserve adequately? So you speak about building up the sewer reserve for future anticipated costs, and I, I saw a couple of things on that list that seemed like they would potentially be very high priority, and I'm wondering, would now be the time to consider the water rate? So in, the, in reference or in comparison to the two uh, changes, the in, in, improvements we need to make at the wastewater plant and then what we're proposing for the water side, the water side changes and water side costs are com a lot less. So um, we haven't fully figured out all the costs on the wastewater side, but we're looking at a substantially larger number than the water side. So right now the water rates are appropriate for what we plan to do. Um, there will be some changes as time goes on. Um, we do not know what our permit for water is gonna give us as far as requirements from the state, what we have to change. Um, but as far as the actual capital projects, the additional possible well in the north end of town and then working on some other uh, things at Centennial, those things will probably fit well in the existing rate structure with small increases, not large increases. So it was a very interesting discussion we had where you presented a couple of alternatives about water and you did mention that you wanted to wait till we were through this permitting process before we sort of dove any deeper. Um, but I'm wondering what you anticipate in terms of that coming back around and us having a more substantial conversation about what of, what of those options we would be pursuing vis-a-vis -vis water. So I think when we talked about, we said we were already starting to do uh, taking care of baby carriage and making baby carriage a little more um, user friendly is a good word for it. Uh, we're, audit, we're working on automating baby carriage. We're working with someone at the, this point to do that, putting together the scope of work for the bidding of the project. We've already put a generator in at baby carriage to, to improve, the, or we purchased the generator, we have to install it. Um, and then we're gonna purchase a generator for the well four, which actually is part of the baby carriage system. So that system we've already started working on and we're starting to upgrade that. And then we've been doing some smaller repairs at Centennial and at, um, Atkins as well, all within the money we allow K for capital planning. So those are already going on. The bigger changes will be if we actually do a full upgrade to Centennial. And then if we do <coughs> purchase land for the well in the north end of town and we actually install the well installation of the well and connecting the well is a, is a much more costly process than just purchasing the land. And um, that will be something that will, um, that'll be something that is driven more by the permitting than anything else because there will be some changes in our facilities and what we have and what we don't have. Time, guesstimated timeline for coming back and looking at that? Oh, uh, <coughs> um, probably, in, Next budget cycle, we'll talk a little more about it. It'll probably, uh, the way we're looking at it is we need to find a piece of property first 
And once we find the piece of property, then we can then start figuring out what we need to do for the site. Um, we'll do some testing on the site. We'll do pump testing. We'll do water quality testing. We need to know whether the water has iron and manganese or any other issue that has to be treated. Um, then we can start playing around and developing a treatment process for the site. So a couple of years and that doing that, and then we'll probably be coming to you. So maybe three years out once we start. When is the permit from the state due to be renewed? Uh, we've already submitted our renewal application. We're waiting from the state. So you just, whenever they're ready, they'll tell you? Uh, yes. Okay. Other questions for, yes. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I noticed that when I was looking at the material presented on January 5th that included um, historical data that um, when you look back, water rates were always higher than sewer rates and uh, rated per hundred uh, cubic feet, and um, but they've been creeping towards each other. Um, the sewer relative to the water has 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 just been that. Now we're actually at the point where it's going to be greater. And I was wondering if that is the experience in other communities and what trends other than what you've already reported might be contributing to that. Well, we've actually, when I first started here, the water and sewer rate were actually the same. Um, so they separated a little bit, and now they're coming back together. And I think what for us has been the driving force is whatever capital projects we have going on, and that drives the more of that difference in rate as, than more than anything else. Different communities will have different rates sometimes. Uh, some communities will have the exact same rate. So across the state, it's different as well. So, But as Amherst, we've kept them within within probably, I mean, they've always been within 50, 60 cents of each other. Other questions from the board? Um, if not, I would entertain a motion for the, the change in the water and sewer rate, or the water, to set the water and sewer rates, I should say. Okay. Um, I move that the select board acting as the water and sewer commission as described, prescribed by the Amherst Town Government Act, hereby maintain the water rate at $3.80 per hundred cubic feet and increase the sewer rate from $3.75 per hundred cubic feet to $3.97 per hundred cubic feet, effective July 1, 2018. There's a second. That was. 380 and 390, correct? Mm -hmm. Is there further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That would be unanimous. It's one person absent. All right. So next on our list, and again with Mr. Mooring here, is uh, we've talked a little bit about over the past few months uh, about a secondary water meter for agricultural use. If you share with us. A little bit that would be great so you have the memo we sent out earlier um, roughly we found there was probably 12 farms in the entire town we took got that list from the agricultural commission and the planning department they have a list actually on their website of listing the farms on it um, based on that there's about five farms in the area that actually are in areas where they're sewer so there's only probably five farms that would be affected by this change. But if we make the change, we would standardize it for everyone um, and, and bring it into compliance so that they're all the same and we treat them all the same. So <clears throat> the proposal before you is that we just don't charge a sewer fee to anybody who is using the water for agricultural reasons. And agricultural reasons, we mean to be raising a crop that's consumed um, and raising animals that are for raising animals. Um, I won't say for, for consumption, because some people don't, but for an agricultural purpose of raising animals right. and foods. Um, so the uh, it's done differently in different places. Um, we found it kind of varied depending on where you were. Um, the minimum we found was that people just charge you the flat water rate, because you are using water that's been treated to potable standards, and you're using it for the, for the crops. Um, which could be used for human consumption instead. So we, we, that's why our proposal is, is that we do not charge the sewer rate. We do make them install a separate line that goes to the agricultural use 
there's a backflow on the on the separate line, and that that has to be properly inspected yearly as, in accordance with the state laws. Um, that's basically it. If there's any questions, so just one quick question regarding the backflow. It's a regulatory requirement of the state anyway, or is it just ours? It's a, we're required by the state to enforce backflow rules, and if you're not using it for residential and it's not got residential uses, there has to be additional protections that have to be installed. Okay, great. That's what I wanted to be. I was thinking that was my understanding of it as well, but I just want to make sure of that. Mr. Bogman, did you have anything you wanted to add about? Uh, no, this is a, an item that had come that uh, had come to your attention by a member of the public, and uh, you had asked us to look into it. And so this is the recommendation. If you say, yes, we want to do this, um, we would come back to you with actual language and uh, parameters in terms of defining what makes an agri what defines an agricultural use, um, what are the requirements for tying into the to system or, ha or separating the system, and trying to quantify some of those expenses so people would understand uh, what the um, options are for them because a lot of people might say well I'm looking at putting in a, a well uh, I'd like to compare that to <coughs> having a separately metered um, uh, use for my agricultural use um, I think the purpose of it and would, I'd like to make sure we're on, we're on the same page on what the purpose is I, our understanding is that the purpose is to encourage um, agricultural um, farming specifically but also livestock uh, in the town of Amherst and um, that's sort of the reason that we would do this. It would not, it, it, it's really is focused on agricultural uses. And I'll just make sure that we're on the same page on that. Questions or comments from the board? No, go ahead. Well, um, we've talked about this for a while and I'm, uh, I'm really pleased to see it before us. I, um, I, I guess we're not going to be actually voting anything, but um, it's something I strongly support. And I think Mr. Bockelman's clarification is important. It's not just all uses that don't take water out and then put it in the sewer system. It's specifically agricultural uses that don't use sewer because there are other things people have talked about, their swimming pools or whatever, where you could also make an argument, hey, charging me sewer rate or I'm watering my lawn a lot. We're not talking about those uses, albeit they may not be also entering the sewer sewer system, but this is um, in recognition of the cost burden on agricultural um, users and wanting to promote um, as much active farming in our community as we can. So um, I'm hoping soon we'll be able to actually have that additional information so we could get this on the books. Mr. Steinberg? I was pretty much going to say the same thing. I uh, also uh, firmly believe as I look over at uh, the town seal on the wall over there behind Mr. Mersbach and that uh, has a book and a plow and I think that the plow is there for a purpose that so we have a tradition of uh, agricultural uh, agriculture being a part of the tradition of this community and uh, we have a lot of land that we have tried to encourage into um, um, remaining in agriculture um, through um, the incentive program. And um, I very much um, want to try and find a resolution that um, economically makes it um, more viable for um, farmers to succeed in what we're um, hoping that they can do. Ms. Brewer. <coughs> So in addition to that, on a different note, I want to express some confusion. One, we had received back on the 8th our standard water and sewer rates memo, which we got another copy of tonight. And there's a sentence tacked on to the second last sentence before the recommended motion that says, an authorized implementation of a policy for use of agricultural irrigation meters, which is not discussed anywhere else in this memo and was not on our motion sheet for tonight. And tonight, I don't understand, I don't have any idea why this, what we just did, was an, art, was an agenda item tonight, because we said the same things before. We still don't have any language. I, I don't understand what we just accomplished by posting this for the public to come in. We're 
where we didn't get any additional information. We didn't get a repeat of what we'd gotten before. So were we expecting that the public would come in and remind us how important this is? Were we expecting that we were going to get some things on the desk tonight, which is what I had assumed since it wasn't in the packet? Um, not that I need us to repeat things, but we if are. we're getting to authorization of implementation of a policy, we still don't have anything, and nothing has changed since the last time we discussed this, to my knowledge. So I'm just confused right. about where we're at. No, I think the, that when we set the agenda, we were thinking there might be an opportunity to gather together that framing language around articulating agricultural use um, in advance of the meeting tonight, okay. and that didn't happen. It did not. Which we would have hoped to have had, but, but we didn't. So it was, so, a, it was an optimistic right. agenda. It was an optimistic <laughs> agenda okay. item, if it yes. Had, we would. That happens. Right. I was hopeful for language that we could vote on as well, but it, it, it wasn't such that we could. But it does, and you know, we do get the opportunity to articulate clearly that this is a discussion about agricultural use and sort of try to articulate that a little bit, even though we haven't formally sort of dug out the language potentially from like state law or our own bylaws, because we've have some, we've taken action at town meeting around defining farms for farm stand use and things like that. So we'll, a little due diligence there that will hopefully be such that we can get it articulated and hopefully when we meet again, it'll be ready to go and ready to vote on and we won't have to drag Mr. Mooring out again. We, we might have some people here to speak to us. So I, I do agree yeah. with you that it, is there anyone f thank you is there anyone from the uh, public that wants to comment on this at all or or are you uh, you certainly can if you do I would love for you to come forward to the mic so that, that we pick it up on the audio um, so feel free to <laughs> bring, bring, bring them up <laughs> I'll so steal the phone <laughs> just make sure I identify yourself for the, okay. for the audience at home please uh, Ronnie Wagner, Veronica Wagner from Northeast Street on the farms, one of the farms there. Um, so a couple questions that have come about, obviously the language hasn't been developed yet. Um, who would be responsible for actually developing that language to present to you? So if you want to take that. So, so um, the, the, we've been working with the assistant town manager has drafted up some language that came in late this afternoon and would review that with the um, superintendent of public works and we'll put that together in an actual policy for the select board to respond to. Okay, um, next question. As far as the cost of the secondary meters, would that burden be falling on the actual property owner or would that be assumed by the town? I believe all the costs would be incurred by the property owner if this is something a, a path you want to choose to follow. Okay. As a question from the ag exemption, as we've identified, um, service is not rendered with the sewer charges up to this point, which you guys are have heard probably too many times to hear again. Um, with the fees, because we've isolated the issue at hand, how is it fair to then push the reconciliation fees onto the property owner again? Does that make sense? Right. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure I understand what reconciliation fees means. Basically, the cost of installing the additional meter. I see what you're saying, yeah. Like, to actually fix the solution, why is it then the property's owner's responsibility to do so? And... I, I guess what I was saying is that would be our recommendation to the board, is how okay. we do it, and the board could okay. judge that. Okay. Um, well, maybe I'm not thinking about it correctly, but when I think about it, what I think is what, um, when I'm building a house to live in, um, I have to put in the equipment for the, the, um, the different, you know, meters and um, devices, and I, I never, I actually never thought that this wouldn't be a cost for the property owner. So if I'm not thinking about it, correctly, maybe you could explain, but I, I just thought that the operator is the one who provides the equipment. From our perspective as the farmer, and please do not. Oh, I, I really want to understand. Yeah, and, and this is basically our issue at hand is bridging the gap between the two. And I appreciate everything that you guys have done to entertain this topic, believe me. Um, but pretty much the monies that we've already paid into the sewer system over however many years this policy has been in effect has been money that's gone. And I can understand installing the correct apparatus 
as part of an operating expense, but at the same token, it, it's kind of like hitting us with another blow. And with it only being five farms in the town of Amherst, I mean, if it's $1,400 times five, you're looking at, what, $7,000 roughly? Sorry, on the spot, can't do the math. Um, it's a drop in the bucket for what the town spends on operating expenses. So I just think for the benefit of truly being pro-farmer, I don't understand why these farms that have been suffering this consequence for so many years has to then be, yay, I don't have to pay $1,400 in sewer fees, but instead I have to pay $1,400 for a meter. I understand it's just for the first year, but at the same token, from our standpoint, it's still a little frustrating. Um, and don't get me wrong, I understand Amherst isn't the only town in the state of Massachusetts that is looking at this issue. Um, one of the things that I know, I'm assuming you guys all got to see the letter from um, Ms. Jones from Cinda, um, where the state is actually looking at the APR program and auditing, the state's conducting an internal audit on the Department of Agriculture. And we've been invited again to discuss topics with them at hand. And this is one of the topics that came up at the first meeting, which it's saying, go Amherst, you're working with the farmers, keep up the right momentum where we really wanna just do the most fair thing possible. So. Could I do a follow up? Sure. So if we did entertain your suggestion of absorbing the initial installation, um, that would still, under the discussion we've had, um, there's an annual inspection of the backflow that's required, and that cost, the way I understand it, the proposal would be borne as well by the property owner. Um, and I, I'm not sure what that kind of, maybe Mr. Moran can tell us approximately what that would cost, but um, do you have an objection to that being um, charged to the property owner? From my standpoint, I wouldn't. Um, I, if I remember correctly, and in sitting at that initial meeting, I think you said 35 to $50 for the annual inspection, roughly, like forecast. We probably haven't said it yet. OK. Oh, OK. All right. I mean, that type of thing could be even seen as like a permitting expense, where in order for us to have a burn permit, we have to pay the fee every year. Like, I, I can understand that. It's just kind of the installation that when you don't have much to work with, it's challenging. So you look at really evaluating all aspects. Right. I think the thing I think about with regard to that is, um, I'm not unsympathetic to it by any stretch of imagination, but I think that what we would have to consider as a board is that moving forward, so absent of the current five that potentially are available now, there could be somebody somewhere else that might decide to do this two years from now and so if they're starting from scratch, then maybe it's appropriate to charge them that installation fee. So I think if we were to mm -hmm. entertain an idea of it, there's a certain grandfathering or articulating of that relative to folks who've been, um, and I'm not saying we will or won't, I'm just yeah. sort of so, no, brainstorming I think, ideas here yeah. that it may need a certain grandfathering if we, if we did that just to, to not mm -hmm. place a burden on our, our water system that's an unintended consequence of some, mm -hmm. some sort of inclusion of, of installation there. I jump in because um, we haven't really had a chance to discuss this and usually I'm all about having people pay <laughs> for stuff uh, and opportunities for revenue but I'm thinking about the four million now maybe doubled for the installation of sewer in Amherst Woods without any betterment fees where people said hey you know I live here why should I have to pay or whatever the I can't articulate the arguments but we have just provided quite a lot of public benefit at public expense for um, sewer work without any cost to the homeowners. Other communities choose to do it differently. So when I look at that example, I'm more open to the idea that, and I agree with you about sort of prior users versus you know somebody who comes in next year, hey, it's cost of doing business, and they haven't paid into the sewer fee. Right. to the sewer fund. So um, I think in a way we have kind of, at least for discussion purposes, a rationale um, for looking right. at that suggestion. Right, right. 
Yeah, and I think it, it just to back to the separate from this, but the sewer connection. So in so the extensions of the sewer service, generally speaking, to date, we have not charged a betterment fee, which is a sort of part of the cost of actually building the sewer lines themselves. The hookups, if you choose to attach your house, you still are on the hook for the, the hookup. The added value of But that's that. a different, that's a much different level of cost. And that's, again, this is sort of separate from, I'm just sort of painting that picture for folks who don't know what betterment fees are, but. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're two different things. They're very different in a lot of ways, but they're not. Ms. Rue, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, yeah. and I, w I was glad that we got to that point before I needed to talk. And so, because we are, <laughs> we are, to trying, to, we are trying to, we're, we're trying to be sensitive to what's the context of other right. things that we do right. this way. And always trying to get people to pay for things, as Ms. Kruger pointed out, so more delicately. It, but at the same time, this is one of the public goods that we do. And given that it is a small number, I would be incredibly interested in looking at okay, to move, get, take care of this group of people under these very limited conditions. It's a very small box. It's not like somebody can say tomorrow, oh, didn't you know about me? I'm a farm. Um, it, it would be, as you indicated, somebody new, doing something new. And then they have so many other new charges at that point that this is not going to have an effect on them. And they haven't been impacted haven't been, yeah. the way the other farms have been historically. And this is a chance to do better than we used to know how to do. So now we know we have another way to do it. I would also um, express, despite my concern, that we wish we would have lots of things happen and we wish we would have had information tonight. It's not reasonable to assume that we would get information on the Friday and necessarily vote it on the Monday because we would perhaps want other members of the public, if they were interested, or if the Wagners felt like they really wanted to come back again, <laughs> et cetera, if there was anything confusing about it. Because it's clear that if it had come to us tonight, it would not have allowed for the possibility of not charging them. We wouldn't have known what that looked like because right. that wouldn't have been the recommendation. Right. So that doesn't mean we won't think of something else, right. a different aspect of this. So I just caution us to, as we develop it, try and get it out to us ASAP with the, the rationale, which could still be the same rationale from staff, but understanding that we're going to want you to also present, I think yeah, that's becoming clear, mm -hmm. the alternative of doing it this way and what that might look like and, right. you know, how it, as we, as I indicated, I think it's a fairly small box that people fit within right. rather than it sort of becoming a precedent establishing issue. Right. Right. Thank you. Right. Mr. Senate. I, I'm not looking for this information tonight, but I think we would be helpful when we get to the discussion is a um, lot more detailed explanation of what the costs are to um, implement um, this change if we go forward um, because I have no sense of where one has to put in essentially the, the bridge, the why that, um, in the lines so that you separate out the two uses of water and how much uh, piping and plumbing is required and whether that varies by farm um, because of logistics within each individual property which seems to me to be an expense that is additional to the question of the expense of the, the meter itself so I think that did you have other questions or comments? No, that was add? Okay. amazing. Okay. I didn't know if anybody else a... had questions, but I can step down so Mr. <clears throat> Morin can step up. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Mr. Morin, you had a couple of things to add, I believe. So as you think of this as a box, and it being a relatively small box, you also need to think about a limit to the box. Because as Mr. Steinberg says, each farm is different. Some of these farms have been in existence since before Amherst was Amherst. Um, thinking about that, they have buildings scattered around, and then when they got water, whether it was well water or town water, they plumbed it together the way good New England farmers plumb things together. Um, so <clears throat> to say the town will resolve all the issues on a farm to put this in the play may actually be quite costly to the town. Whereas if you say you will put in the device at the separation, and then as the farmer wishes to, he can correct, or he or she may correct 
the other issues as time goes on and we give them time to do that and help them identify what the problems are, that is a much more, um, hopefully a much more acceptable way. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple of issues we have on another side of town which if we didn't have old inspection reports, we would actually be in houses right now trying to find out whether they're connected to some old piping and stuff. But we actually had all the documents and it basically was an old farm that was taking water off a spring and they just piped it in and when they built a house for the son or daughter, they just piped that one in and piped that one in and it's this huge connection. But they, have <clears throat> they had disconnected it all and actually had documented it all because one of the people was a plumber <laughs> so that was very fortunate for that for us and them so it can get very expensive and it can get very detailed um, so <clears throat> limits on the box is what we'll present to you and then we can go from there um, I totally forgot the question I told you I'd come up here and answer backflow cost year over year so it depends on the device and it depends on what you're doing. So it, I believe it is a $50 and a $30 fee. There is one device that's inspected once a year and there's one device that's inspected twice a year. So I believe the $50 once a year and the $30 is twice a year. I wouldn't hold me to that right now, but that's how it goes. Um, and so that's really the cost of the device and monthly or yearly inspections. So thank you for that. We'll look forward to some memo from you and the assistant town manager probably? Yes, yeah, so we'll try and have something to you at your next meeting. Okay. And the sooner is better, obviously, on that. Thank Which you. I think February 5th, I think is our next meeting. Yeah, next meeting, yeah. February 5th. But but I think uh, to your point and, and to Mr. Steinberg's, you know, sort of there's a reasonable limit for what the town can kind of take on regardless of, of, of uh, sort of holding harmless the, the farmers. There's a certain piece that's kind of definitely theirs to own as far as uh, costs and currents and that sort of thing. So we'll try to define those well. Said one thing. Um, I don't know if we've heard specifically on this issue from the Agricultural Commission, and I know that they've had some problems um, meeting and are down a couple members, so this might be an opportune time to say to people who might be watching or listening that um, if you're interested in um, participating on the Agricultural Commission, we very much um, <clears throat> have the welcome mat out for that that committee, and it's a group. You know, we we have a number of things that have come up, such as this. We would really like their input, but um, they they need to add some members. Yes. So. That's correct. <clears throat> thank you for remembering that. Thank you, Mr. Morin. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> so next up. In our agenda is uh, Chapter 61A, Notice of Intent to Convert 1.6263 acre parcel off of Bay Road for residential purposes. Not to be too precise with the measurement of the acreage there. As my name next to it, we have a memo in our packet, I believe, that discusses uh, both the property as well as um, a memo from, I want to say, the planning board relative to this particular piece of property. Um, Mr. Bachman, do you want to paint a bit of a picture for us here? So this follows a typical process um, that um, when uh, when someone wants to take uh, a piece of land uh, out of Chapter 61A, it's, it need, requires the approval of the select board. <laughs> and you usually request the advice of the planning board and other boards. And so those are the memos that are in your packet. It's a very small piece of land. Um, and I think the, the planning board did vote seven to zero to recommend that it, the town not exercise its first right of, of refusal. Under the state law, the town has the opportunity to purchase this land if it so chooses, and it's not a piece of land that we believe the town would be interested in. Okay. Any other questions or concerns regarding this property? Just, um, maybe this was in the material and I just remember it, but um, I believe when, um, property comes out of chapter land status, there's a repayment of deferred taxes, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering what that amount would be coming in. Uh, total rollback due is about $1,000. It's in the memo. I, I just couldn't remember. I looked at it. So barring any other questions, I would entertain a motion
I move to vote to not exercise the town's right of first of right of refusal option in accordance with MGL chapter 61A section 14 to purchase approximately 1.6263 acres owned by the late Mary Snyder said land shown as parcel B of an unrecorded plan of land dated November 28, 2017 included in the notice of intent to sell and marked exhibit A further identified as a portion of parcel 56 on assessor map 27C, formerly known as 10-27C. Is there a second? Second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous with one absent. Okay, next up, since Mr. Brody is here, I'm going to reverse the order and have him come forward. We have the cultural district signage placement at Realignment Park. And so I believe you've come with a sign. <laughs> Share with us and tell us about this, if you would be so kind. I'm happy to bring the sign. Uh, I wonder if we could put it where one of the cameras could pick it up. Actually, if you said it, I think in front of me, usually right in front of me will work, I think. They, I think they can people at home can see it. That'll be perfect. We've now become part of a cultural center. <laughs> cultural district, I'm sorry. We've been harboring these signs now for nearly two years. So we feel uh, excited about the possibility of actually having them erected uh, sometime soon. Uh, you have in your packet some information on it. Uh, as you probably know, uh, as part of becoming uh, a Massachusetts um, uh, cultural district, we are required to erect a minimum of four of these signs. They're all, and all the cultural districts have the same design and the same size, uh, just the names change. So we have four, three of them are on private property, but there is one that is on town property and that's on Realignment Park. And we are looking for your approval to um, erect this sign adjacent, as it shows, to the cow and realignment park. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions. I know it came before you once before. Um, and I think there was some concern expressed that it may have been too high or if the tree that it's near leafed out, the sign wouldn't be visible. I'm not sure whether that's still a concern, but I'm here to address it if, or any other concerns you may have. The um, Public Art Commission has approved the placement of it, and we now require that the um, select board also weigh in on it. So, so yes, uh, so we're trying to coordinate the application process there because there's three private applications plus there's one building permit sitting on my desk waiting for your action. We will package those up so they all flow through the different permitting boards together. So the perm permitting boards have one conversation about all four cultural district signs. Um, the only caution on our, on our part is that before the sign is installed, we'll, the town will want to, there's a lot of stuff underground there that we'll be really cognizant of. And the, on the actual location not all four signs go through the same boards for example there's one that goes through the um, local historic uh, authority uh, on the Amherst media property but the others don't so it is a little complicated puzzle to get them all done we're trying to schedule it so that it happens efficiently great Ms. Brewer you had a so who actually does the installation Um, the one in the town land would be the town for sure. The one on private land, not really sure. I would like our motion to reflect that, mm -hmm. that the, since we're only talking about the one, yeah. when it says to be erected on a post, it doesn't say by whom. Doesn't, yeah, good point. Any other questions or comments, concerns? Did you have a modified language you wanted to offer as part no, of the motion? I don't know if we want to say by the town or DPW. I was kind of hoping Mr. Bachman would make something up that he wanted to write down. 
<laughs> That's <laughs> the right. last thing you want to do. <laughs> Um, why don't we say after the word park, we add by the, by the town. Okay, we'll figure out who. Would someone like to make the motion? Yeah, I move to approve the placement of an Amherst, cultural, Amherst Center Cultural District sign to be erected on a post at the north edge of Realignment Park by the town as requested by the Amherst Center Cultural District and approved by the Amherst Public Art Commission. Second. So motion is second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. One absent. Thank you very much. Thank you much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for bringing sort of matches the cow colors, doesn't it? Right. Like, yeah. Cow and that sign. Okay, next is our remote participation policy revision, which Ms. Brewer has thankfully very quickly crafted. We had, last time we discussed this, we changed the termination date to not be anything. I guess we made it to infinity and beyond, <laughs> just because I have to say that. But, uh, but there were other changes to it that you were making relative to state law, and so we have a, a, a couple of versions of it in our, in our package. You wanna kinda walk us through the contents of that please sure so we talked about this on select board on December 18th and we had a motion that just eliminated the sunset clause and thereby removed the expiration date of December 31st but we knew that there were some other changes that needed to be made and so as we were busily getting ready for MMA I was sent an email that said so what are all those changes and I said oh right we were gonna talk about that several weeks ago weren't we so we pulled them together and here are the changes if you look at the actual um, this is not in the order I would prefer, but one never knows what order Alyssa would prefer, so there you go. Um, if you look at the stapled packet, the second item is a four-page document that's the policy on remote participation. It still shows voted date, 123 at the top, but if you notice the footer, it says it's revised tonight, assuming we revise it tonight. And the only change on that first page, which helpfully is in color print, is the second last paragraph says, extended indefinitely by simple majority vote of the select board December 18th. So that was the thing we already did. We had that motion and made that happen. Now we need to do the other things. So if you move on to page two of the policy that starts definitions and scope, you move about two thirds of the way down the page. And because there used to be specific um, I, how shall I put this, incredibly overreaching reasons that were provided by the Attorney General's office, even though many people told them that was a bad idea. They had them in there, so we had put in some of our own language to show that what we were trying to incorporate into those five items, and now we can just take those out, because now you no longer have to say what your reason is, so you don't have to explain whether or not child care is actually an emergency, because none of that needs to be discussed. Fortunately. And you don't, you no longer have a determination by the chair, which is something that made us nervous years ago, whether or not your reason was good enough. Uh, you just have to say that you have a reason and that goes. So we just lined out all that material there, which then you'll see on page three permissible reasons for remote participation. Instead of having those five reasons, it now is effective October 10, October 16th. The only reason that need to be stated is that physical attendance would be unreasonably difficult, and that can just be said like that. So then on page four, oh look, no edits except to the footer. Then if you move back to page one again, sorry about that, of your stapled packet, it's the remote participation policy and regulation remote participation checklist. So this is as people, okay, I've read the policy, now what do I need to know? And so you just move down through this, and again, we are clarifying that its physical attendance would be unreasonably difficult. We no longer have to say what the specific one of the five things is, but all the rest of the script remains the same. And then in terms of the person who's applying, that checklist is for the chair, basically. The person who's applying prior to the meeting, you'll note it says at the top that it's been revised as of tonight and we simply take out the one or the more of the following factors. We just say my physical attendance is unreasonably difficult and leave it at that. 
So we just had to pick it up from all those sections. We are reminded as we read this that although communities can set their own regulations, as long as they don't conflict with the regulations that the state has provided, that was an argument we had a long time ago about geographic distance. Well, was the state deciding what that was or what we were deciding? Luckily, that is no longer here. However, one of the options specifically that I wanna make sure we're clear on is that the state did give us the option of saying that bodies could opt out. We specifically chose not to do that. We said, if we're gonna do this, it's available to all committees. And so it's been used very little it still has the limitations in terms of number of sessions in a row and number of sessions per year. And we've not run into anyone saying to us that that was unworkable, so we didn't make any of those changes. These are all simply to reflect what the current regulation is from the Attorney General. Thank you. Any mm -hmm. questions or comments? Yes, I have a couple of things. Um, that are minor, but I first of all want to thank Ms. Brewer for doing all of this work under such incredible time constraints. Um, just a couple minor things on the um, third page of the uh, remote participation policy and regulations. The page at the top begins with regulations for use of remote participation. Mm -hmm. And we should make it clear in the strikeouts that we're also striking out the first iteration of the words permissible reasons for remote participation with the citation to the uh, regulation. Otherwise, it repeats twice mm -hmm. in the, it, as it will be adopted. The reason I didn't catch that is because I still don't know what you're talking about. Um, Where are we? On the above the red. Above the red. Right above the red, oh, you have you permissible reasons for remote. Oh, yeah, I but, see. It, but you have it again right. in the second. I see. You you're only saying the once. heading could be one removed, time. right? One time's enough. One or the other. I meant right. Yeah, That's exactly so, right. so I, I just wanted Thank to strike you. that for duplication purposes. Will someone make purposes. a note for Ms. Puppel on that? Yeah. The Thank other you. thing that I wanted to point out is that in the um, attachment, which is the remote participation uh, re request form. The request form. Um, after the strikeout words, uh, sort of in the middle of all of that, there's a colon with the words, uh, my physical attendance is unreasonably difficult, and that should, should be, be a period, period. Yep. and not a colon. So I would like to have that change made yep. as we adopt it. Yep. And yes, Ms. Puppel, I sent her an email that said, change this paragraph, this sentence, this paragraph, this sentence, this word right now, and she did it all. So I'm sure she will adapt. I, I, I understand really that. I was just yeah. trying to be So careful. I didn't give her those, so she didn't make them. <laughs> so it's not her fault. So we don't have a motion on this. it. I, no, um, I uh, am going to move and I have this in writing for Mr. Pockelman if he needs it. I move to approve the amendments to the remote participation policy and regulations as presented to the board in uh, pre uh, preparation for this meeting um, as amended. Is there a second? Second. Excellent. Is there further discussion? Hearing none. Yes, please. I'm sorry. Well, I think it's, you know, we've had this a year, and I think these are these are really good improvements, and thank you, Ms. Brewer, for doing them. I'm looking at some of this language that we're now getting rid of that I think we got from the state, and I'm like, that's like a last minute lack of child care or elder care shall be. It was required. We had I know, no choice. I know, and that, that, that's problematic, as is trying to define the distance if it's only a mile, but you have to walk because your car's broken and you have a, I mean, it, it just becomes absurd. So I think, you know, both the state and, and us, we're learning this, and I think this is a much better version. Absolutely. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And that's unanimous with one absent. Right. <clears throat> so
So next on our agenda, um, we have committee boards, appointments and reappointments. Um, so I didn't know if, if Mr. Steinberg wanted to offer any comment or introduction to these uh, three that we have for, in front of us tonight. Uh, well, I want to uh, just make a comment that as of right now, Ms. Kruger and I have actually been performing together in the appointment process, and I think that it's really been working very well. It's sort of, we were thinking of it as a transition process, uh, but I really appreciate her expertise because she has worked with these um, for such a long period of time. And we need to take these separately and um, the um, Community Development Block Grant Advisory Committee, I think that um, Ms. Brewer may have been involved in the interview in yes. this one. And um, it is my understanding from having um, um, the conversations that uh, Ms. Kruger and I had that this was a committee that was really in great need of getting positions filled so that it could have a quorum to actively participate during this process. And um, it's my understanding that um, this uh, person has been reviewed and is recommended. Um, and the Transportation Advisory Committee um, was um, an interview that was attended to, um, in a, um, and Ms. Kruger can speak to it. Um, well, I'm just pleased that we're bringing these um, recommendations to you tonight. Mr. Balkman was part of the Transportation Advisory Committee um, interview, and then we have um, his own recommendation on Conservation Commission. And I'm just struck with the high caliber of volunteers. And, and there's some people, a couple of these, there were more people than openings, and they're, we're hoping there'll be opportunities for some of those people to serve in the future. And I think we have a couple of um, other um, candidates that are gonna come before you in the next couple of weeks. So people have been applying, some new members have been recommending some other people and helping with the recruitment. So um, I'm just really impressed with the people I've gotten to talk to as we go through um, our kind of streamlined interview process for appointments. And I'm just really pleased that we have these three for tonight. So with that, I would uh, move to appoint Janet Daisley to the Community Development Block Grant CDBG Advisory Committee and Mark Rabinsky to the Transportation Advisory Committee TAC through June 30, 2020. Is there a second? Second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? So that's unanimous with Mr. Wald absent. And if you'd like to, Mr. Bachman, did you want to say anything about your appointment to the Conservation Commission? Or? Um, again, we, uh, to echo what Ms. Kruger said, we had uh, multiple candidates for this slot, and both of them very good, uh, excellent candidates, actually. Um, so it's really exciting to hear, to see a younger person, but also just two people who are uh, really highly qualified. So I, as it feels good to have someone ready to go if there's another yes. vacancy <laughs> so and, the, and they're both both highly qualified this was the one that was recommended from the group that interviewed great thank you so if we can have a motion i move to confirm the 10 managers appointment of jen hoyle fair to the conservation commission through june 30 2020. is there a second second is there further discussion hearing none all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. aye. Mr. Slaughter? Yes. If I could just reemphasize what Ms. Kruger said earlier, we do still have openings on the Block Grant Advisory Committee. We do, in fact, have a couple of applicants, but we do not even have sufficient applicants for the number of seats that remain open. So we would very much encourage people to continue to look at that, and they're doing their work right now. So if you have time right now in your schedule, now's a great time, the time of year that they do the majority of their work, and then they will wrap up their work by the early spring. And so if you're a person who has big commitments in the late spring and early summer, this could be a really good fit for you. So please consider applying, and of course the information is all available online. Great. Thank you. Okay, so that takes care of all three of the, the appointments under the committee board's appointments and reappointments. 
So now we're into section seven, licenses, public way and meter parking reservations. Uh, we have a consent calendar, although I think we have some questions that were raised about the consent calendar. Yes, I have three. Oh my goodness. So, uh, well, then you win because I only have one. <laughs> we might have the same one. We can. You can tell tell me if we, you'll tell me in a Sounds moment. Sounds like more like the dissent um, calendar. For, no, they're not dissents at all. But um, first of all, I would ask uh, my uh, colleagues here to just quickly grab the page for the two University of Massachusetts top of the campus ones, and I think that what you will find is that the one that is marked number three relating to an event at Memorial Hall is in fact a um, special wine and malt license and not an all, all alcoholic. And number four, if you look at the, the reverse side of the same page, you'll see that the it's a special license um, for um, all alcoholic beverages in Old Chapel. So those got reversed, and I did try and call Ms. Popple to see if I could get a reprint of the motion sheet, uh, because that would have been the easiest way to do it. But Ms. Popple was not available today, so I'm having to do it this way. The other thing that I have on those two is that traditionally we had the motion read something like this, motion to approve the um, special license to top of the campus incorporated. And that's omitted from these. And um, I think that it's probably a better practice to indicate who we're giving the license to. So um, I would like to change number three to read, move to approve the special license to top of the campus incorporated to serve wine and malt beverages at a reception in UMass Memorial Hall within the remaining language staying the same. And the next one, move to approve a special license um, to top of the um, campus incorporated um, to serve all, um, alcoholic beverages at a reception in Old Chapel and then the remaining language. And the other thing on Winterfest, um, it's again two things. One is that the address of the event should be 1089 North Pleasant Street, not 241 Pine Street. And um, I would prefer that it is mo we move to approve the special license, um, the grant, uh, grant of a special license to Simple Gift Farm to serve wine and malt beverages, and then change the address to the correct address for the event as listed in the application, 1089 North Pleasant Street. So those are my three. Ms. Brewer? So, Thank you so much for catching those with CHOP of the campus. And yes, we should have a more consistent structure and that makes total sense. Otherwise, you'd have to add CHOP of the campus to the end of board member or something. And like you say, we normally have it in the middle. And thank you for noticing they were switched in terms of which types mm. of license they were as well. Cut and paste will do that to you. The other is that I need us to pull the special license for simple gifts at the correct address that Mr. Steinberg indicated out of the consent calendar. There is nowhere near enough information for this to be in the consent calendar. So I wouldn't, given the changes to the two motions that Mr. Steinberg suggested, actually the changes to the motion, mm -hmm. all three of those motions, I would suggest we probably do each of those individually and then just Since the, there's only the two left, two. we might as well just, well, we can do we, two as consent. Can't we do the consent calendar as amended while, okay. right. while still pulling one out? Because our practice is any, anything can get pulled out. But I think we can leave the ones he amended in, just say, I would say, um, I move to approve the items listed in the consent calendar as amended for the January 22nd, 2018. With the exception oh, of item five. Wait a second. Amended comes at the end. I'm ahead of myself. For the January... 22nd, 2018 agenda as amended um, with number f f five removed. Yeah. If you want to be really clear, but that would be part of the You've already read those. Okay, so I'll, I'll second that motion that Ms. Kruger just made. Thank you. Is there further discussion about 
One through four. <laughs> one through one four. One through four as amended. No, they're beautiful. All right. <laughs> Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? And one absent. So we've got it. So if, well, I write this down. If Ms. Brewer, would you like to go into number five a little bit more? About I'm sure I could pull up my email that I had sent to the town manager, but I, I'll just let's start out simple. We don't have enough information. This is an applicant that does not normally serve alcohol. It, we cannot process this in this short of a time frame without some additional information. We ask all kinds of questions about serve safe alcohol or tips training, which we don't require yet because we don't have a policy that does so. But we can't ask that applicant about this. We don't have any familiarity with this particular spot being licensed before, to the best of my knowledge, et cetera. Um, this is another reminder that we haven't purposefully, we have purposefully not updated our form because we know it needs a lot of revisions to it. And one that would be helpful to the applicant as well is to be able to say who's going to actually manage the service because I have a very hard time believing that this individual is someone who is terribly familiar with serving alcohol. So um, in terms of regulations, whereas many times organizations such as this will go ahead and hire a caterer or hire someone from one of the other licensed facilities in town who clearly has the appropriate certifications. And I know that sometimes we say, well, the police chief will talk to them and I'm sure it'll all work out. But this, this, is, this has nothing. We don't have a memo from them. We have nothing here to work from. I guess I have two concerns, uh, two things. One is that on handwritten on the um, application form is uh, you should have my workers comp and tip certification on file. If the tip certification on file is on file and I'd be willing to have that be a part of the motion that it is uh, conditional upon okay. it being on file. But we do not have another meeting prior to February 3rd and we just had a very good presentation about how important Winterfest is and how much advertising has gone on about Winterfest. I would be very hesitant to do something that would disrupt an event um, that is being advertised associated with Winterfest at this point. Mr. Bachman. So I have information that came in since you started your meeting. Um, first was an email from the chief who said one of the questions was, had there been any incidents at this with this group before? And he said, no, there haven't been. Um, and from Ms. Puppel, um, said, uh, they ha this group has had a special license before. The tip training is a requirement of the chief to ins ensure that um, he we, that we provide them with the information on where they can purchase the beer, et cetera, per at Mass General Laws. Uh, and typically, we don't issue it until those requirements are met. So those, that's the, the scant information I have for you. So because I raised the objections, that's incredibly helpful to me. We need to stop doing it this way. Mm -hmm. We need to start having a memo in our file that says he's done it before, he has the TIP certificate, he maybe hasn't met with the chief yet, but he's planning to, and we won't issue it until then, rather than assuming that's all going to magically work out. It's unreasonable to put that kind of assumption both on this body and on Ms. Puppel and other staff to assume that they will have to remember to do all those things, which if they can do those as a checklist, they can do them before we get mm -hmm. the information. But I also recognize that you mentioned that this is coming right up. They didn't turn in the application until last week. And so that's one of the reasons this has gotten so complicated is because they didn't turn it in in a, what might be considered a more timely fashion. They only right. turned it in on the 15th. Right. So and Received um, on the 18th, actually. Yeah, exactly, and received on the 18th. So that that all does give me more confidence associated with the situation, but I would really strongly, so that I don't have to give this lecture again, ask that we not do this again this way. Or at worst case, have the person show up so we can ask them those mm -hmm. questions mm -hmm. um, if we can't get the information into our packet. Well, I, I appreciate that concern. I mean, it's sort of, okay, it came in, <coughs> it came in without a lot of lead time. I am inclined to do this condition and conditionally if we need more information. Um, but it sounds like <clears throat> our, our form is pretty deficient in alerting people to what they need to give us. And so that, put, that partly puts it back on us. So I'm willing to be more lenient than strict given that 
even if it's an interim form before we get to the ultimate form after we do our policies, we just need to clean that up and say, have you had tips? You know, whatever those questions are, they're valid questions. We, we really need to have a form revised for the reasons you stated, Ms. Brewer. Have you crafted a motion for us, Mr. <laughs> yes, Mr. Uh, Steinberg? Yes, <laughs> right now. Right um, dramatic pause there to sort of give him another 30 seconds yeah. or so. <laughs> I could have just kept going while he's, while he's writing. Um, Once again, we're... Okay, so what I would do, uh, what I'm going to move is... Um, conditioned upon the approval of the chief of police and proof of TIPS certification to approve the special license to Simple Gifts Farms to serve wine and malt beverages at an event in conjunction with Winterfest Amherst at Simple Gifts Farm, 1089 North Pleasant Street, on February 3rd, 2018, from 12 to 5 p.m., Jeremy Barker, Plotkin Manager. Is there a second? Second. Is there further discussion? There is, Ms. Brewer. I'm not concerned about it because Mr. Steinberg likes to write the motions, and that's fine with me. I will mention that we have said in the past that we are concerned about putting the word conditional in the motion itself but we have somehow reflected that it is in fact conditional based on those items. So whatever phrasing works for you that, to make that so. And I'm sure that when we do write our alcohol policies, we will come up with a better word for that. Um, because it is, it is conditional, but it isn't that we're gonna come, our approval changes, it's that they actually won't hand out the thing. Our part is actually done. Right. It's that mm -hmm. they won't give it out right. upstairs. But I think that's been more of a concern with permanent licenses when they're missing a document or something. Yeah, right. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And so that's unanimous with one absent. Thank you. <coughs> so next on our agenda is the town manager's report. Mm -hmm. So if you'd like to sure. take us through. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a few things to update you on since our last meeting. Um, I usually tell you about the Cup of Joe. We had uh, about 10 people show up at Atkins Market uh, um, at the flagship store on, uh, on January 12th. And it was a really good conversation. It was the day after the budget was presented. And so some people came with that. Other people had just, some people came just to talk and um, listen. So it was a really good, good session. The next one is on scheduled for February 12th at 7.30 to 9 and at a location to be determined. So I haven't figured out where to do that. We're sort of starting to re, you know, re reuse places. So um, the, um, at your last meeting, we discussed social services funding, and um, the uh, and I asked you to hold on that, and uh, and we had a um, the select board representatives and others. I had a meeting subsequent to that meeting, and came to, and after educating ourselves on some of the procurement and financial um, uh, requirements and uh, limitations. One key thing mean, being that we are able to use this, these funds for an, a period that goes beyond July 1, which really helped us rethink how we wanted to approach this. Um, we will be issuing an RFP uh, for uh, food security and outreach into the Latino community, um, hopefully in the next week or two as we, as we build this. And this will be, that will be the primary use of the $60,000. We will offer that out um, to, uh, uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the community to service our, the members of our community. Uh, this was identified as the highest need from, our, um, uh, from members of our staff. And as we started looking at 
what the options were in terms of how we would evaluate different things. Um, in terms of managing this project, it was determined, we determined that it was uh, best to have just one project moving forward instead of two, uh, which is what the previous memo, which I was uh, anxious to move forward on, but got ahead of myself. So that is the proposal, that is the, the, um, the path forward. Um, and I think the members of the select board who are present are in agreement. I'm not sure if you want to comment on that or if we're, I can update you when it goes out and all those things. Well, my only comment that, um, thank you, Mr. Bachelman, just um, that we were very much looking at what would make sense to do that may not be a recurrent or ongoing program or project. So we wanted to pick something that was discreet that we could do in the time allowed with the money that we had that was people um, recall an additional appropriation for human services from or community services that um, happened at um, our is it annual time? Yes, I'm mm -hmm. reaching back now. Um, so we, so this met the sort of basic criteria that we came to through discussion plus the identification of community needs. So that's all I wanted to add. No, I don't know any, Yeah. <laughs> I, thank, thank you. you. Um, other things. Uh, the, as you recall, the town of Hadley issued an RFP for ambulance services to begin on July 1, 2018. Um, we did not bid on that. The, the, the ambulance, their ambulance study committee invited us to meet with them, which we will tomorrow night uh, with the uh, fire chief and the two assistant chiefs to answer some questions that they have to comment on the services that we're providing to them. Um, so we have, we've reviewed the um, RFP submission by the one vendor who had submitted it, which they are, would be charging $290,000 for the ambulance service to locate an ambulance in their community. Um, one of, that was one of the requirements of the RFP and one that we could not meet or would not meet because it didn't. we have more of a regional ambulance service model where we take our, our, our ambulances and our fire, we have paramedic, firefighter paramedics, so they do both jobs. And so when they have to respond, they have to be available. And it didn't make sense to us to locate an ambulance in the town of Hadley, and that was one of the requirements of the RFP. So it, since we couldn't meet that criteria, it, it didn't make sense. And there were other things in there, smaller things that were just not in conformance with, with law. So uh, they were asking us to do certain things that we didn't think were appropriate. So uh, we'll go and talk with them. Have a, we hope to have a very good conversation with them. Um, this what one interesting thing about this is it did point out that we're we've underpriced the service according you know they went to the market the market mm -hmm. spoke and um, that has informed us that we have not been recouping the uh, money we should be doing for this this service in conjunction with that we've also gone out for an RFP for ambulance billing services uh, we've received uh, those responses uh, there's a, a small committee that reviewed the responses and then we matched them up with the pricing which is the normal process we have a um, company called comstar which has which i've dealt with before and that with um, they do a number of communities in the, in the area that we've checked out and they're very good um, we're uh, there's a meeting last week with the treasure collector and the assistant fire chief to talk about logistics i have to talk a little bit you know I have some questions that I need ha to have answered, but we're hoping to um, look at that in terms of how we are handling our own internal staffing, because obviously we have someone who's doing that work now. Um, and so I think we have a pretty good plan of, for moving forward um, at, uh, in the relatively near future. Um, the goal on this is to have um, a service that would do the billing for the ambulances, and um, they're usually much more efficient about in comprehensive in what they actually bill. So that's that's something I look forward to. So two things on the ambulance front. One is we'll be meeting with the town of Hadley tomorrow night. The second is the uh, the billing system. To most people, if you're they're more they're more focused on billing the insurance companies and they know how to collect the money better that way. Um, we already talked about um, LSSE. The um, also, we had um, two police cruisers that were damaged on the same 
night. Uh, one was damaged pretty heavily, and it was the, one of the oldest cruisers, so that will be totaled and replaced. The other was, a, was had just very minor damage, uh, a newer cruiser that's that's going to be um, correct, you know, fixed, and it may already be back in service. Nothing major on that one. It's just uh, body work. Um, the uh, town of Pelham is seeking some, um, support from us as they start to replace their treasure collector. Uh, one of the things they've, they're looking at is either asking us to do the full service, for instance, we already do the assessing service. The other thing that they, in fact, I saw, saw a, a couple of the members at the MMA meeting, um, they've asked if they're not able to hire someone by their the, the um, retirement date of their current treasure collector if we, if we could help them out. And I've talked with Claire McGinnis about this. And it, we're sort of looking at what that would entail. Um, we always are interested in working with our neighbors and providing the services that they, that they need if we can do that. And I'm sure we'll be able to work something out. Um, mm -hmm. The dog park uh, committee is meeting this week. They are sort of narrowing their search or their focus on a portion of the I'm going to call it the South Landfill because they're old and new. It's confusing to me. So it's the landfill, um, south, the South Landfill. Uh, so there is a small port parcel there that um, they would be doing a site visit on Wednesday to look at the, the one or two acres that they need for the dog park. It seems to fit with the overall management of the plan. This is in con would be in conjunction, and the permitting would have to be done in conjunction with the um, solar array that's being planned for the north landfill. Um, we will probably have to do a, some kind of environmental work the, uh, to make, make sure that this passes muster with all the different state agencies and local agencies that would have to approve it. The key for me is that I was really urging them not to seek to buy a piece of land and take another piece off the, of land off the tax rolls. That's probably the, the smoothest path to getting a dog park if you want to do it expeditiously is to find a, a piece of land, buy it. Um, and uh, I think that we're really moving forward and using, utilizing an existing piece of town owned land for this purpose. And, you know, there's some more steps to follow, but I think that uh, the assistant town manager and superintendent of public works have been working hard on this to see if this, this site actually can work. It's a great site. Uh, it's, on, it's on a main road. Uh, there, there'd be a parking available. Uh, it'd be adjacent to a, a place to walk your dog if you wanted to walk on leash around the landfill, but then off leash uh, adjacent to, um, to the landfill. Um, the North Amherst Library, uh, the proposals are due on Wednesday. Um, this is for these are for, for the design services. Uh, in accordance with the town meeting article. I'll be setting up a small committee to evaluate the proposals that come in. There was a site visit last Wednesday or Thursday, um, and four firms showed up to view the site. This is actually during the snowstorm, so it could be, we don't know how many proposals will come in, but we assume if you show up at the site visit, you'll submit a proposal. Uh, I've asked a member uh, of a representative from the Board of Library Trustees. I've asked the library director to se designate someone. Our owner's project manager, Mr. Mooring, will be on it. I've asked the assistant town manager, um, Mr. Zomak, to be on it because of his connection with the work that's being done in all of North Amherst. Uh, and I've asked the petition, the lead petitioner, Ms. Ms. Holland, to serve on this committee, and she's a, she has agreed, and they've all agreed to serve on this committee. And this is just to look at the proposals to see who do we want to hire to spend this $50,000 on. It's not to, um, they're not submitting designs or anything like that. They're just saying, here are my qualifications. Here's something that, here's the, and then in a separate envelope, they put how much they would think they would need to charge to carry out the, um, the work. Um, I want to remind you that the school assessment formula group is meeting, um, or the school, the four towns meeting is Saturday, and that'll be an interesting meeting. Um, health insurance continues to be a very hot topic. We have cr uh, formed a small group of uh, four, one, four people from the Insurance Advisory Committee and four uh, members of the staff. And we're, we've been meeting pretty regularly on a weekly basis to dig into our, the town's health insurance. It's a big issue for us. We've, as you recall, we've had three increases this year um, in order to stabilize the trust. 
Uh, as a reminder, the trust, we, we don't buy insurance. We are a trust. The town and the employees put money into basically a, a bank account in essence, and then as, as the bills come in, we pay them out. We hire Blue Cross and Harvard Pilgrim to manage those, those um, accounts, those, the relationships with the hospitals and doctors uh, for us, and they get paid an administrative fee on top of that. So what we're trying to do is um, not let this happen again. And so we, we, everything is on the table. Uh, we will look at whether we should stay self-insured or go to fully insured program. I uh, had a couple of really good meetings with Blue Cross at the MMA meeting this weekend. Uh, we'll be working with them pretty closely. Um, and uh, also we'll be considering whether we should have two plans. Right now we offered Harvard Pilgrim and Blue Cross. It seems uh, that seems to be two two companies offering two plans each. Each one offers an HMO and a PPO. They're very identical. So there's some cost savings that maybe had there. Um, it's a really good working group. Um, we have a meeting again on February 5th, and then the, the full insurance advisory committee is coming back together on February 7th. Um, our goal is to have recommendations from the insurance advisory committee to the, the trust administrator, which is the town manager, by the end of February in terms of what direction we want to go in and um, how we want to move this forward. It's the most important um, uh, benefit that ed every one of our employees receives. So it's, it's really important for them. It's important for the town because it's a major uh, budget item for the town. And we've been, we were really, I'm very pleased that we've had a very successful working relationship with our retirees and with our unions. So we're going to hope to keep moving that forward. But some really hard decisions are going to need to be made. And um, not everyone is going to be happy, but those decisions still need to be made. Um, what else? That's pretty much it. Um, oh, Senator uh, Markey will be at the Amherst Regional Middle School on Sunday at 5.30. And uh, the chair has been asked to say a few words. And um, I think the chair of the Regional School Committee will be asked to say a few words as well. Um, they expect to have some perf some musical performances, but it's basically a town hall meeting where <clears throat> the senator will will entertain comments from the public or make some comments, and uh, they anticipate several hundred people to be present at that. And so you're all invited, obviously. Um, and uh, so that's that's Sunday at 5:30 at the Amherst Regional Middle School in the auditorium. So I think that's my list for tonight. Any questions or comments from the, on the report? Yes, Ms. Brewer. So one of the things that came up in passing in conversation at um, MMA was the fact that because the um, Group Insurance Commission dumped out on state employees, of which my husband is one for all of you who have forgotten that he works at UMass, that, oh, surprise, you don't get to choose from a whole bunch of plans anymore. You only get to choose from three. And so this was done with basically no notice even to the people voting on it. And so um, there's obviously a big hue and cry about all of this. But the mention, the mention that was made in passing to me and that I hope you'll incorporate into your future, a future report from us, is that this could impact the small number, but certainly there are some staff who are connected to state employees who, when you have a spouse, obviously you can choose which of your plans will be the one that you have the family on, and this could impact your discussions here just as it's impacting, you know, what people are deciding over at UMass and many, the many other state facilities that our various townspeople work in. So it's just one more piece of complication to add in at a time when you're already trying to sort things out. So we appreciate any thoughts people share on that and how they, they might perceive that impact playing out. It, it already is happening. Uh, we've had even members of our insurance advisory committee talk to their members and they say, yes, we switched from my spouse's plan to the town's plan. The town offers a very rich uh, plan at a very low cost, and it's just a rest, it's not a sustainable model. So that's why we have to make plan design changes. We have to make, um, in many ways, we are attracting people. Um, people are coming to work for the town just for the health insurance, but 
as we went around, there's 14 people who are on the insurance advisory committee. Pretty much all of them said, oh, yes, I know someone who's jumped onto the town's plan from the university or from another community. Um, Northampton has a GIC. Um, Greenfield has a GIC. Um, the university obviously has a GIC. Um, Hampshire County uh, Trust, which is about 72 members in it, very small towns typically, they have a GIC-like plan, and that's sort of the model we're looking at in terms of the benefit structure to just bring us in alignment to what other public organizations are offering their employees. That's the, the sort of blunt reality where we are right now. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, that was, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of a hue and cry about what the GIC decided and without notice to anybody. And I know there's a lot of organizing around that issue already. Other questions or comments for the manager? If not, then uh, we'll move on to uh, member reports. Who would like to report? <laughs> or do we have any? Member reports, maybe that's a better way to ask them. Yes, I, I do. I was waiting to see if anybody else was stepping forward. Uh, don't forget the Kanagasaki Sister City. Um, the, they're coming for their annual uh, visit, and as always, there's the opening reception as the junior high school students come and meet their families here in the town room uh, March 21st. And... Uh, uh, it's typical to have the town manager and one member of the select board um, speak. I've done it the last few years. I don't know because, uh, since Mr. Slaughter is now um, into the chair position and he's uh, been a host family if he would like to take that role. Um, other things related to Kanagasaki, um, um, we um, have been trying to set up um, a couple of meetings with them um, in which we would uh, do it um, by um, Skype or other technology. Um, and the first one will be uh, pro um, some members of the Sister City Committee um, and uh, some members um, of the Lifelong Learning Center in Kanagasaki, and I'm hoping that that happens uh, within the next uh, month or so. Um, I did get here from uh, uh, Kanagasaki over the weekend that um, they're ready to proceed with doing that, and um, I don't think that this is a remote participation um, problem because all of our members will be here um, and um, people from Kanagasaki are not members of our committee. Uh, so the other thing having to do with uh, Sister Cities, however, is at the last select board meeting at the beginning of the month, uh, we received a, um, a letter from Terry Johnson um, regarding uh, the consideration of a um, additional sister city relationship with a community in Italy. And um, at the chair's request, <clears throat> I drafted a letter um, to um, Ms. Johnson, and um, I have a draft which um, uh, has been, I've, I've talked with the chair about, um, and uh, it is a description of the existing sister city relationships in our attempt at third sister city um, relationship and the challenges and difficulties in those relationships. Um, and just, um, it does not take a position because that would be inappropriate, of course, um, but it asks um, that if she decides to go forward that she give consideration to the issues of how to recruit um, a group of people to serve on a committee and how what the goals of the um, sister city relationship would be and uh, how it would be funded since the town is not in a position and does not fund any of our sister city relationships and uh, um, I'm hoping that that information will be helpful and then it uh, leaves it to um, Ms. Johnson to decide after receiving that whether she still wants to go forward or not. Um, it does not suggest an answer to that question. And um, so I think that that was it with Sister Cities and um, the, uh, Mr. Rockman's already 
mentioned the four town meeting and I have been doing some additional discussion and work with people on this question that um, will be the, a difficult part of the conversation on Saturday, which is the uh, regional assessment method uh, and talk to several um, people for advice during the MMA conference, which uh, I found to be a very helpful conference this year, both in the sessions that I attended and the networking that I was able to do on these and other issues. Uh, I really appreciated, appreciated the opportunity to attend the conference, and uh, so I just wanted to conclude with that comment. Thank you. We'll go next. Um, while we're talking about our um, recent uh, attendance at the municipal, Mass Municipal Association Conference annual meeting um, Friday and Saturday, um, I was able to, I, I was invited to present along with senior planner Nate Malloy on a parking workshop, which I think went very well and we were actually asked by citizen planning and uh, training collaborative if we would maybe repeat that in March at their conference that's usually at you know, Holy Cross College so um, I asked once they had once um, the MMA staff um, Daniel Dominia had time he would scan in the evaluations that he has so we could actually look at them because I always find it helpful to see what said Paul was able to um, see part of that session so that's kind of neat um, while we're talking about parking the downtown parking working group did meet last week and as you know we're kind of on phase two of recommendations we had a whole bunch of work on phase one those things have been implemented have come before you and now we're doing kind of a, a second round look at certain things and we'll we've sort of started our list of recommendations um, and working on that for the spring so we're we're kind of in the middle of that um, I attended as liaison the transportation advisory committee meeting last week and I believe that the complete streets proposal that they're working on or policy I should say is going to come before this board in February and those of you doing agenda setting probably have it in your sites I don't remember the last date I saw in uh, an email from Amber um, but that's coming to us for um, approval and then lastly um, Ms. Brewer and I both attended our um, adult use or our marijuana working group um, what we had been calling recreational is now by the state being referred to as adult use so um, I'm going to kind of leave that for her but we had a, in our internal team meeting last week and then we both attended a session on adult use marijuana at the MMA conference that um, was helpful and I know we have um, a look at what Mr. Kravitz prepared to submit we in the first week in February there's some um, hearings or meetings across the state and um, some of us are going to one one session in Holyoke and some are going to a session in Greenfield um, so with that, I will stop talking. Thank you. Ms. Brewer? So I could keep talking about marijuana for hours and hours <laughs> and hours, but in our packet, and speaking of our packet, Mr. Steinberg, are we going to get a copy of that letter about the uh, Italy Sister City Committee? Um, we Does will, we'll and on? there's another question that has come up because uh, we, I, as, as I pointed out, um, Ms. Johnson's letter to us was not posted into the packet for that meeting in ah. January, and I uh, merely made the point that um, the chair needs to make a decision on consistency to make sure that if we put one in, we put both in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot Time of sense. Oversight. That'd be great. Um, and it's always tricky when we're responding to something from a previous packet. It's like, then where do we put that so that people could find it? You know, so good luck with that. Um, but we do have items in our packet, one written by, one sent by Mr. Kravitz based on his drafting it and many of us giving him input and him graciously including that input. And then also his memo to the town manager with copies to health director and planning director who are part of the internal working group. But again, so that these documents can be shared 
with the different groups. So planning board can see it, so board of health can see it, and in addition to all the reporting back, we all do verbally to have some documents in writing as to where we're at. Um, when it comes to what happened at MMA, I will say that it did not, it was an incredibly informative primer on marijuana that Ms. Kruger or I could have given to ourselves for 45 minutes of the majority of the presentation. So it was one of those unfortunate things that it wasn't communicated well what was to be done at that particular meeting or the expectations that we may have that are too high because Amherst is so far ahead of the game in this respect too. And so for people who have been avoiding it up until now, that was probably a useful time for them. For those of us who have not been avoiding it and have been trying to dig into the details, it was extremely unfortunate to not be able to ask more questions of one of the CCC members, of being their CCC, not our CCC, um, Kay Doyle, who in fact formerly was with KP Law, and also Margaret Hurley, who many of you have gone to see speak about this same issue. So things got a little unmoderated and out of control from the standpoint of not, it was perfectly all civil and everything, <laughs> not that kind of unmoderated, but the kind where you don't get to the part that you were looking for by being there. Um, in my subsequent discussion with KP Law about how that went, it was suggested that there could be a conference call between myself and Joel Bard from KP Law and Kay Doyle at some point to follow up on the points that Mr. Kravitz has already made on our behalf, in addition to us showing up at the hearings at the, in the first week of February, which, as Ms. Kruger pointed, we're going to kind of divide and conquer, and um, Mr. Kravitz actually is away that week, so we're going to somehow have to survive without him both driving us there and supporting us and having write, written material for us, but um, we, will, we will always testify on our own as well, so we will manage to do that. We want to hit both Greenfield and Holyoke, again, because there are going to be a number of people there who are just open, who are there, as we have seen so far, who are there for a free-for-all, which is not where we're at with regulation, or who still just don't want anything to do with it, which is not where we're at either. We want to be able to figure out what possible things we can do locally associated with licensing, because at this point, all we're hanging our hat on is one sentence that says there can be a local licensing authority, but it doesn't give any indication of what it can do. And so I don't think this is one of those situations where we can do whatever we want until right. we get sued. But um, we'd, we'd like to get a better understanding of how that's going to work. And another issue that came up during the particular presentation was some confusion associated with social consumption. All these wonderful terms we're working with, you know, adult use and social consumption. And social consumption is covered, for those of you who I know spent hours reading the draft regulations, is talked about there, but the confusion arose because it makes it sound like, oh, well, social consumption, this is how it's going to work if you want to have a place that could be either a primary use or as a secondary use. You could have a yoga studio that might want to use some infused oils. You could have somebody that might want to use creams. You could have somebody that might want to actually allow vaping on their, on their site, et cetera. And they said, well, you can't have alcohol at the same time. So that was an interesting decision. What, so they've come up with some rules associated with that, which is more than apparently anyone else in the U.S. has done in terms of details, but what they didn't say is, oh, by the way, remember there's still this part in the law that says if you want to actually have social consumption in your community, there has to be a petition of the residents to make it happen. So then the argument from the original writers of the ballot question is, well, we didn't really mean for it to say that. So there is, they didn't get it worked out when the legislation was written to try and clarify all these things. So the CCC is trying to work with all these different piece parts and pull it together. So that is an, in addition to the issues we brought up in this letter, that issue came up during the thing. And I said, wait, what now? <laughs> and Ms. Doyle said from the CCC, no, of course you still have to do the particular petition process, which always seemed kind of strange to us because it's not like any other petition process. Normally, a place like a select board or a city council would say yes to something, or if they chose to say no, then the residents would petition. Not that we couldn't say yes and that the residents would have to petition. So please don't look for social consumption to happen anytime soon because it's still being sorted out. Ms. Brewer, can I just 
add, jump onto your comments, because I think it's happened, you had to leave for your own session, but one of the things you'll see in um, Mr. Kravitz's letter, and we had a little discussion before the conference um, here in our team, it asks the town to let the um, Cannabis Control Commission know if the applicant is in compliance with local laws, mostly meaning land use regulations and zoning laws, zoning bylaw. Um, and Mr. Kravitz was really concerned that since our process is a special permit, how could you say somebody was in compliance if the zoning allowed it, um, but they hadn't received their special permit yet, or if the special permit took more than the 60 days um, of response period, and so there's a bunch of consternation about that. And I think you'll see that in the letter, but um, I was able, to, at the very end of that session, uh, Ms. Doyle said, oh, well that, we're really looking for whether it is possible that it could comply, because they've had instances where they got, um, in medical licensing where it got way down the road and they found that it wasn't even possible in the local community and so they want to make sure that the zoning would allow it were the special permit to be granted. Of course, all these things have to get clarified again and reiterated, so I don't think it's bad that it's in the letter, but that was kind of my guess on a common sense basis that if it's a special permit, you're just saying it could happen in the zoning district, but it doesn't mean the ZBA is going to say it's okay for any number of reasons because they have their special permit criteria. So I think that was an important clarification. I, I was glad I stuck through the 45 minutes of bylaw summary to a little bit more of the action on stuff. We didn't ask the question, someone else did, but it was important. And, uh, on the subject well, of on-site social consumption, uh, I was wondering if there has been any indication as to whether there's a conflict between this law and the law that was passed by the legislature banning smoking um, in public places and how that is being addressed. There is in fact going to be a way that they are, thank you, that they are going to, um, in theory, that an organization, an owner of a business, will be allowed to ask that there be smoking, in fact, and not just other forms of consumption, but to actually allow for smoking. But it seems to be in a very, you know, infant stage of being developed in terms of the rules. But there is a, there is a theory, there, there is some provision there that indicates that despite the fact that there's even the law, as we talked about at town meeting, that says you can't smoke where you can't smoke, that they're trying to allow for it in certain types of businesses if that's the business model the business wants to have. But obviously that would bring up all the questions we've always had about smoking and its effects on staff, et cetera. So it's unclear where they're that's, going with that. that, that that's, that they uh, haven't killed it off. The other is, um, of course, the concerns of the Board of Health and our belief that the Board of Health should be able to pass appropriate uh, regulations um, as they have for many years on the question of smoking. Exactly. Still a lot more clarification. Right. A lot more is going to need to come out, even though they wrote a lot of pages. Yeah. And they're working hard on it. I mean, looking at a lot of things I never even thought about um, in terms of representing small growers, small business operators, minority business operators. So they're trying to at least have some equity in this new business so that it's open to not just, you know, big, you know, big corporate marijuana companies, um, but the, there's some pieces of the pie for other people too. I, I bring this up because um, if we have two members of the board who are representing us in essence at these hearings that you're aware of issues that we're concerned about and I raise it in that. Our, our health vein. directors. And Absolutely. And thank you for reminding us from that standpoint. Yep. And then she is also, she doesn't necessarily intend to um, testify, but we have incorporated that into what we will say yeah. at the time, based on whatever news articles have come out between now and then as to what particular things are happening beyond the issues we specifically mentioned here associated with zoning and 
associated with areas of disproportionate impact, which is also an area that is really unclear, <laughs> as well as really. local licensing. And so, again, they are doing an amazing job. I mean, if we think back to when they got this deadline, we thought, there's no way they're going to get this done. And they have done an amazing job, but they are also trying to do more than anyone else ever has, apparently, in terms of designing this. And to the point that some of the medical establishments are saying, you know, you don't really have to work on some of this yet. And them saying, no, actually, we do. We need to work all these details out. So it's going to be a race to, right. to get there, to get some of these things worked out. But we are still looking for a local licensing role for a, a local licensing authority, which we serve as in this town, associated with alcohol, and a very similar thing as to what Board of Health is allowed to do with tobacco. And and so when we talk, they they the Board of Health was very happy in terms of like serving sizes and everything that they started outlining in much more detail associated with the regulations. Great. They're happy with that. But, you know, just because it's legal federally to sell two loose cigarettes, it's not legal to do that in Amherst. And so our Board of Health has an opinion about that and should be allowed to do so. Did you have other? Mm -hmm. Member report items. Sorry, do do I, I not added. just get to talk about you, marijuana? You can stop there, but <laughs> you can. I'm, I'm giving the opportunity that's my to do only other topic. things. So I will go ahead and say, because it is our chance to do so, that Mr. Bockelman and myself also served on a panel that was about. Um, hiring a town manager in a time of change, which was kind of a nice, subtle envelope for all of the difficulties that a variety of communities have faced with ours, the passing of our town manager, others where they were going through a charter change and of a completely different kind of charter, and another with a very surprise resignation, and then also hearing from a consultant who'd worked in a variety of complicated situations. And so we were not really clear when we got there who was going to show up. Again, much like the marijuana issue, would it be people who've not heard of this before, or people kind of taking the graduate level course? And in this case, would it be assistant town managers looking for a job, or would it be selectmen at, at the meeting, because it obviously wasn't counselors. And so it, it did seem to be a mix of people. I'll be curious to see if they do get what evaluations they do get and what they say associated with it. But we each spoke briefly uh, and tried to be very brief about what particular things stood out to us about our particular circumstance, because in some ways searches are searches. but given things that happened to us, what we learned from those. And then we got to hear from the candidates' perspective as to how they thought it all worked. And so I thought it was super interesting, and I hope that some <laughs> of the other people did too. And I thought that went very well. So we were glad that MMA included us in that. And oh yeah, don't forget, I also got to judge the annual town reports, which they did not even have there in person for people to page through and say how wish they wish that those were the reports they wrote but people did get certificates and that was nice for them and that that was lucky and there were also innovation projects and websites that also got awards and so that's always nice to see your colleagues being recognized for all the work they put into things. Are you ever going to volunteer to do that again? Well certainly not that particular task and I'm quite certain they won't <laughs> ask me to do it again <laughs> given how complicated it turned out to be and the intensive scoring rubrics. The other thing I just wanted to mention totally not related to marijuana or MMA is that it's town meeting time again and so on what does my ch cheat sheet say on Monday February 5th which is the same date as our next meeting at noon all the citizen petitions are due except the ones that are simply resolutions and I know I'm not saying resolutions are simple because they don't matter I'm saying they're not bylaw changes and they aren't money articles and they aren't zoning things but everything that's not a resolution meaning non-binding is due on noon Monday February 5th the only, then the actual ones that are resolutions are not due until Monday the 26th. But that's new this year. For those of you thinking about that, please don't say you wish you'd known because it's been on the town website for many months now, and that information is out there. So we will be on February 5th reiterating the fact when we're at our meeting that we are not accepting any additional warrant articles, and they only require 10 signatures at this time of year. At, other than resolutions after that meeting. And of course, town committees and boards are still continuing to work out the language of their things. We may have articles, who knows? But um, anything that's citizen petition-wise, the warrant will be, so to speak, closed on Monday the 5th, other than 
those articles. So I just want to remind people of that because it is a change from previous years and it is does like coming right up given that town meeting doesn't start until April 30th. Thank you for the reminder. Yes. So uh, I didn't mention the, the MMA annual meeting because I thought you would do that and I'm glad you did. Um, 13, the MMA annual meeting is the largest gathering of municipal officials in New England and New York, in fact. And so 1,300 uh, officials were registered to show up. It's the largest trade show in the area. Um, I think we were the only community that had panelists on two different uh, sessions. And that's, I think that's something the townspeople should be very proud of because they, it's, a, it's competitive to be on these panels and, and they try to pick topics that are breaking news or, or something that's really informative like the marijuana um, panel t um, every year. So I think there were 27 panels, 27 workshops total. And so we had representatives on two of them. And I think that's a really speaks highly of the kind of work that we're doing in the town. Um, for next year, they begin thinking about workshops for next year, April, May, June type frame. So we should be thinking, we've talked about this on staff already, what are things that we think they should do? They're, they're, they sort of internalize, internally you know, brainstorm on these things, but if we have things that we think have a broader interest in the Commonwealth, we should think about who, who what, what the topic is and what we'd like to present and who would be good at doing that. Um, they're they're always strug not struggling, but they're they're always interested in hearing the perspective from the the field, as it were, because they do get a little Boston centric, a little state house centric, and sometimes hearing what we're going through and sort of I wish there was a I wish there were a workshop on this topic. Um, I think that would be um, a useful thing. So. Put your thinking caps on for the next next year, and we're, we're always doing a lot of interesting things, and people want to hear what we're doing. So, I just wanted to mention. Maybe we should have like an, an agenda item where we just brainstorm our ten favorite topics. Oh, I thought of one already. Oh, what is it? <laughs> I thought regionalization. Ah. Not, special, not necessarily school regionalization. That could be its own topic. But I think, mm -hmm. you know, what are best practices, hurdles that people run into? Um, you know, we've we've had a couple of places where it's worked well. To do that, mm -hmm. veteran services being a prime example. Um, we've had other places where we've had a lot of struggle, and we've looked at it for a number of years. And some of that's um, uh, 911 dispatch, mm -hmm. you know. And so, I think there are other places that have economic constraints that regionalization, sort of this obvious sort of next step for mm -hmm. people to take. Mm -hmm. But how to do it, how to coordinate it, how to, you know. So that that would be one I can think of mm -hmm. off the top of my head. Um, might be of interest mm -hmm. to people. That's not a. That's not me volunteering to do anything <laughs> relative to that. You'd like to learn more about <laughs> it. I would like to learn more about successful it. Successful models of regional yeah, exactly. Yeah. Something, anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but uh, but anyway, mm -hmm. that was what I thought of off the top of my head. Uh, as far as my own personal member report, I don't really have much report. Um, I do have a. It's a, a rather busy week uh, coming up for me though. So the MPO, which is the Municipal Planning Organization, I believe is what MPO stands for. I can never remember, but mm -hmm. it has to do with uh, masked out projects in the area. Uh, they're meeting tomorrow. Um, and I think we're getting ready, now it's about the time we really get into the heavy swing of, of looking at the planning for the coming federal fiscal years. And you know, they do what they call the TIP, which is the Transportation Infrastructure Plan, and getting that sorted out for the next, in the next year. And, and uh, so that'll be coming up. Um, and on Wednesday, the PVTA advisory committee uh, advisory board is meeting uh, and preceding that the finance and audit committee which I am on is meeting as well um, I can tell you now that it's uh, given the current information regarding um, what the governor plans to propose for funding for the regional transit authorities um, it looks like it's gonna be a very very difficult year and that the PVTA will likely look at both rate increases which we haven't done in about a decade uh, and it's been a good five years since we last looked at rate increases for ridership, uh, but also probably service reductions. Both of those will be topics on the table and uh, the frame in which we'll look at those will be probably the heart and soul of the conversation on Wednesday uh, about how we go about deciding which things to offer and get feedback from the public on. Anything that gets ultimately proposed will then go to uh, an extensive round of public hearing like we did last June. 
Um, the goal is, of course, to get that process started earlier um, so it's not quite as panicked a time frame for folks. Um, and so everyone has more time to uh, offer comment and suggestion, but also to uh, adjust if, if, if changes are made uh, in preparation for the, for the coming fiscal year. So it could be a very, very difficult fiscal year coming up for uh, PVTA. Um, so those, I think those are the only things I wanted to mention in, in my member report. Um, I'm sure there are other things, but I can't recall off the top of my head. <laughs> um, but I also think uh, that we have exhausted our agenda for the evening, unless someone else has something not Ourselves. anticipated. So given that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And so we are adjourned at, which is going to be 840. 840.